Good morning, everybody. Okay, so uh, today we're going to start off with our COVID update. So uh, good morning, Queensland. Today we have 5,795 new cases and 3,177 uh, positive rats. Uh, sadly, it's my duty today to report that nine people have tragically lost their lives and we extend people in public hospital at the moment, 34 in ICU. Our vaccine coverage is 92.45% at least one dose and 90.48% double dose and 62.64% of the eligible population have received their boosters and 5 to 11 year olds is 41.66%. So that's fantastic news. So I'll hand over to uh, Dr Gerard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Premier. So sadly, we have nine deaths to report today. This, this includes six people in their 70s, two in their 80s, and one in their 90s. Of these uh, nine, three were not vaccinated. Two had received two doses of vaccine, and oh, sorry, correction, three had received two doses of vaccine, and three had received uh, boosters. Uh, six of the people who died were in residential aged care facilities. Uh, again, our thoughts are very much with their family and friends. In terms of hospitalizations, uh, it's, pretty, it's stable at the moment. We have 384 uh, people in our public hospitals being treated for COVID-19, about the same as yesterday when it was 382, and 33 people in, of these 33 are in intensive care. It's the same number as yesterday. In our private hospitals, 24 patients being tr uh, with COVID-19. Uh, there were 26 yesterday. In school-aged children, again, numbers are fairly stable. 1,702 cases to report in the last 24 hours. Uh, there were 1,668 reported yesterday. And as I've said many times, the vast majority, if not all of these, are, have mild uh, illness. Um, we have, there's been no increase at all in the number of hospitalizations among children uh, since, the begin since schools returned last week. Uh, 912 cases among the 5 to 11 year old age group and 790 in the 12 to 17 year old age group. I'll hand back to the Premier. Oh, sorry, go ahead, sorry. Given these figures and at the end of the week, where are we as a state? Uh, well, as we've said, we have, we've said a number of times, we're heading towards the end of our wave. And we, I've said previously, it's looking at the waves of the pandemic overseas and interstate, it's generally been about one month up and one month down. Uh, the pandemic wave began here in Queensland uh, between Christmas and New Year. So uh, that started in the Gold Coast. It's not, it didn't start quite evenly across the state, but uh, we expect we're effectively at the, will it, it come to the end of the wave uh, at the end of this month. Now, what happens in the tail beyond that is still somewhat unknown because the whole world has experienced this Omicron wave almost simultaneously. So we don't have a lot of, we don't, there's not a lot of other countries that we can look to to see what happens because we've all been within a few weeks of each other and experiencing this Omicron wave. I, I think, um, the, well, we, as we've said before, uh, things have gone significantly better than we had expected in terms of uh, hospitalizations, intensive care, admissions, etc. We, we were projecting significantly higher numbers uh, than expected. And it, there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever that this is due to the wide-scale uh, wide vaccination. Uh, some of our epidemiologists have been doing some estimates on what would have happened uh, were there not vaccination. And we, we, we're talking thousands of deaths and, and hospital system uh, overrun. So uh, wide-scale vaccination uh, before we experience the wave is what has meant that Queensland has coped well with this uh, wave of, of the pandemic. I will let, definitely let Queenslanders know before the end of the month about uh, what restrictions will be eased. Um, I hope to meet with uh, Dr Gerard over the next uh, couple of days and we'll work through what those easings of restrictions will look like. Well, don't forget New South Wales and Victoria have announced their easing, but they were a couple of weeks ahead of us uh, in the wave. So I think that's a fact that needs to be uh, conveyed to the people of this state. But secondly, we're now coming off that wave, those numbers are coming down. 
But don't forget, still we have around 40% of our children that are vaccinated and uh, the wearing of masks is uh, helping to stop some of that transmission. Okay. Yep. So we might, we might use next week. Uh, definitely before the end of the month, so people know they'll have plenty of advance. And, and hopefully if we keep that trend coming down, that's going to be fantastic news. Okay, now I might move on to electricity. So at the moment we know that households, um, a lot of people are doing it tough across this state and it has been a uh, firm commitment uh, of my government uh, to keep our assets in public uh, ownership but also to, to have that asset dividend go back to uh, households and families. So today we're very pleased to announce that the government had took the decision yesterday that we would be uh, giving an asset electricity asset dividend rebate of $50 to households. This will be in people's electricity bills that they receive uh, in the third quarter of this year. So we understand that some households are doing it tough and this is another commitment of our government to continue to ease with those cost of living pressures. And I'll hand over to the Energy Minister, Minister Debrenny. Thank you, Premier. Uh, as the Premier said, we understand that every dollar counts for Queensland households. And currently uh, we are working on an energy plan that will outline and uh, chart our pathway to a clean energy future for Queensland, uh, including uh, cheaper electricity. But we're also down, uh, determined to put downward pressure on prices and ease those cost of living pressures for Queensland households right now. Uh, and our proud ownership, as the Premier has said, of Queensland's power companies means we can again deliver $50 back into the pockets of Queensland households. Now, the Australian Energy Regulator has just this morning pointed out that a combination of high peak demand, uh, the outages at a number of uh, large power stations in Queensland, uh, combined uh, with uh, very high coal and gas prices globally, uh, has resulted in a forecast increase in the default market offer. Now, the default market offer is the maximum that electricity retailers can charge in South East Queensland, and around 11 per cent of households in Queensland who, for whatever reason, uh, have uh, not chosen to seek out a better market offer remain on the default market offer. Uh, and our government uh, recognises the pressure on Queensland households, and we also recognise that uh, over the course of the pandemic, more Queenslanders have been at home uh, using uh, more electricity. Uh, and so that's why we have responded today uh, with this $50 asset ownership dividend going back to Queensland households. Now, Queenslanders can save themselves uh, even more if they do shop around. For example, the average uh, Queensland family uh, can seek out better offers, uh, saving them around $523 a year. But the best way to ensure that uh, Queenslanders uh, uh, and uh, their power prices remain affordable uh, is to invest in more renewables, particularly in energy storage. Uh, and because Queenslanders own their power assets, we can continue to keep downward pressure on prices. Uh, and we know with this dividend announced today that they will be $50 cheaper for Queenslanders. And we also know uh, that under the LNP uh, and their plans for asset sales off, uh, sell offs, uh, that money would have ended up in the pockets of overseas shareholders. Now, we're also investing uh, $2 billion in new renewable energy and storage across Queensland to deliver cheaper, cleaner electricity. By the end of next year, we will have delivered at least 1,815 megawatts of new wind across five projects in Queensland, 872 megawatts of new solar across four projects in Queensland, and 40 megawatts of community batteries. That's the equivalent of two massive new power stations of clean energy for Queensland, supported by the Palaszczuk government. But we could do even more with the support of the federal government. Uh, it's been seven months now, seven months since the Premier uh, wrote to Prime Minister Scott Morrison indicating that we would uh, deliver a $2 billion commitment for new renewable energy and electricity storage here in Queensland. Uh, and since then, despite inking deals with other states, uh, he has not committed a cent to Queenslanders, not a cent 
to help Queenslanders and support more affordable and cheaper electricity here in this state. In fact, what he did uh, was spend $31 million on a campaign about energy, but actually delivered nothing, delivered nothing for Queensland. And again, we see the Prime Minister ignoring the, Queen, uh, the, uh, the needs of everyday Queenslanders. Now, I'd also like to uh, just address some of the other major announcements in the electricity sector uh, that have occurred today. There was an announcement out of New South Wales uh, that Australia's largest power station uh, will close early, uh, and that was an unexpected announcement. And I want to make uh, this clear to all Queenslanders. Uh, we will not be shutting the gate on Queensland's publicly owned power stations because they will continue to play a critical role in this state's energy transformation. And our energy plan due later this year will outline, it will outline both how we will deliver more renewable energy for Queensland and confirm the ongoing role for those publicly owned power stations. And as the Premier said, it is only because of our commitment to public ownership of Queenslanders' energy assets that we can both guarantee more renewables and the job security of Queenslanders, particularly in regional communities. Any questions to me? Well, it's, uh, that uh, matter has been uh, uh, undertaken to be dealt with by the, uh, the Director General of the Department of Premier and Cabinet, and uh, that is uh, not my department. Do you know who it is? No. Can we be clear on that too? Did, hmm. did you or anyone from your office ever instruct a public servant to ask them if something to change? No. Thank you. All right. Um, today I want to announce um, a, uh, a key review into uh, culture and accountability into the state public sector. But before I do that, let me make a couple of um, observations. In my time as Premier, I've delivered on a number of integrity, integrity reforms to the people of this state. We've done real-time disclosure of political donations. We've lowered the caps on the amount that people can donate. We've um, put a ban on developer donations. We've introduced a Human Rights Act. We've restored the independence of the Triple C, not to mention the appointment of Tony Fitzgerald to review the Triple C itself. These build on measures introduced by former Labor governments, including the establishment of the Office of Integrity Commissioner itself. And most of these reforms that I've outlined have been fought against by the LNP. Now, um, I want to assure Queenslanders that I have been listening and I've listened and my government absolutely intends to act. And that is why today I'm pleased to announce that Emeritus Professor Peter Coldrake, AO, has been appointed to conduct a review into culture and accountability into the state's public sector. The review is broad reaching and will incorporate all relevant public service agencies and entities. He will look at six key areas the culture of the public sector in ensuring ethical decision making and impartial advice to the executive, the nature of interactions and interdependencies between integrity bodies, the public sector and the executive, legislation underpinning the existing ethics and integrity framework, adequacy of systems to prevent ethical accountability and integrity issues arising, adequacy of ethics training and communication and relevant policies, timelines of processes to resolve ethical and integrity complaints. Now the 21st century has brought about rapid changes, not at least in technology. And over these last two years during the pandemic, we've seen a lot of people working from home as well. Some people have adapted to this and some people haven't. And I want a modern, dynamic, 21st century public sector in this state. I absolutely believe that Peter Coldrake is the right person to lead this work. He will report uh, in two phases. The first will be in two months' time and the second two months after that. Both of these reports will be released in full. That is a commitment I'm giving to the people of this state. And let me also assure the people of this state that we will act on all of the recommendations that he presents. Happy to take questions. Yes. Yes. Look, they might have been in the past, but let me say this. Um, 
My understanding is that the LNP government also commissioned Peter Coldrake to do some work. He has been uh, a former Vice Chancellor of QUT for 14 years. I have uh, no doubt that he will treat this review seriously and he will deliver key recommendations to government. Uh, no, I wasn't, but I am absolutely confident that he will do a thorough and effective job. Now, this is an inquiry into the Labor Party, the Labor government. Let me say very clearly, the LNP also commissioned him to do work as well. So you must be concerned about the public perception. I think the public should be absolutely, um, should absolutely have confidence in the fact that he was a QUT Vice Chancellor over the past 14 years. And I don't think anyone is going to question his his reputation. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah. Look, I listen to people and I've been listening very carefully. And I've said very publicly that we could do better. And you've asked me, how could you have done better? And I've thought about this long and hard. I've spoken with my colleagues and we have put in place uh, this review. Uh, I understand that my Director General uh, approached him. No. Of course there are protections and Peter Coldrake himself will go and engage with people um, and I would hope that he does random samples as well. I think it's really important to get a snapshot of the public service and also to uh, the interaction between the public service and the executive. And if out of this uh, we can see more training, uh, more understanding of um, people's rights and obligations, that people know where to go and make complaints as well. We've already written to the public service advising them of that. But perhaps there does need to be more training and people need to feel very comfortable and confident in the way in which they can make complaints. Uh, that's a separate, that's, I understand the Triple C is looking at that. Sorry? That's a, that's a matter for Peter Coldrake. Yes. I acknowledge we can always do better. I have said that time and time again. And I pride myself in integrity and transparency in government. Um, and you know, you all know that I was elected on that in 2015. And um, I pride myself in that and my government has given and has implemented key reforms. These key reforms have been voted against by the LNP. And you know, many people um, may have forgotten the, the legacy of the Campbell Newman government, but I haven't. I haven't forgotten that. And I'll stand up against that every day that I'm holding this position. Do you think you've misjudged this issue from the start? I mean, you've changed positions on this multiple times. Do you think the initial response was wrong? I have listened, and I will always listen to Queenslanders. And Queenslanders expect their governments to listen to them and to deliver, to, to deliver them. We're building new schools. We're building new satellite hospitals. Uh, today we've announced a $50 rebate um, on their electricity bills. We understand that cost of living is an issue for Queenslanders as well. And anything that we can do better, we should strive ourselves to have, um, to be able to have a health check on the way things operate. I think that is healthy for the democracy that we live in. But we, all, but we also, if you could, sorry. Sorry? Sorry? Look. At the end of the day, we need to do this review. We need to do this review for good government. Um, and I don't think anyone is going to criticise that. In terms of the last time something like this was done was back in 2009, 2010. So yes, it is time to actually make sure that we are, um, that we are adjusting ourselves to the 21st century and the way in which communication, the public service and training operates. Lydia, sorry? It's a, I don't think so, not at this stage, but Peter Coldrake is able to go out and talk to whoever he wants to talk to. Sorry? Uh, he, will, he will outline all of that. I'm leaving that entirely up to him. 
uh, because I've said very clearly that this is a comprehensive review. We've also done, uh, we've also had Peter Bridgman do two reviews as well for the public service. The first one uh, focused on uh, the public service and changes to the Act. Now the second part was about modernising the public service and also looking at ethical codes of conduct as well. So I think that this review also feeds neatly into his second phase. Do you have confidence in Sorry? Do you have confidence in yes, I have, I have confidence in all of my public servants and un unless there is something... Unless there is, unless, unless there is something that is, uh, unless there is some evidence uh, to the contrary. Because the individual complaints, there's a whole range of mechanisms that are out there for people to have a look at. This is about uh, culture, accountability, and it's also about uh, methods of training that may be needed across the whole spectrum of a modern, dynamic public service. Sorry, can I just raise one other issue too while I'm here? Yep. So, uh, in great news today as well, we have seen the trailer drop for Baz Luhrmann's masterpiece, Elvis. Uh, this dropped uh, a few hours ago this morning. Um, over 700 jobs in Queensland uh, were uh, part of this uh, film, filmed uh, here on the Gold Coast, and I think Queenslanders should be incredibly proud, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the film when it's released in June. Sorry? Uh, it was a contribution between the state and the federal government. Yes? Just a couple more questions, yes? Um, I'm happy to look into those issues. Sorry, I'm happy to look into the issues you've raised. I know that the Health Minister's been here and addressed many of those issues, but in relation to your specific issue, I'm happy to talk to the Health so Minister. Uh, the last I heard, we've, uh, we've secured the site and we're looking at the planning. Yeah. Yes. Uh, let me make it very clear that Queenslanders should be incredibly proud that we have our own purpose-built quarantine facility in this state. It is something that Queenslanders um, are proud of and it's something that I'm incredibly proud of that the construction has been finished. Uh, you can remember the debates when we had people coming into our hotels and the virus was spreading over the period of two years. We had 5,000 people in hotel quarantine. We had hundreds of police we had uh, hundreds of uh, health staff as well. Now, in relation to the capital costs, um, we had to seek permission from uh, the, the Wagners to release that cost, and we did so the other day. The total cost, the total cost, the total, if you can let me finish, please. The total, the total, I'm trying to answer the question. The total cost, the total cost of the WellCam facility, total cost, is below any other quarantine facility in the nation. Can I just ask you a question? Why you didn't outline that you were contributing to the building costs until this week? Were you misrepresenting the arrangement? No, not at all. And, and let me say very clearly, you can go and ask Queenslanders, and they're pretty, they're pretty pleased that they have a dedicated quarantine facility that will be put to use, not just for a pandemic outbreak into the future, that can be put to use for a whole wide range of purposes. And, and, and it started construction in October and it's actually finished. Sorry? Yes. Uh, my understanding was, was that there was um, some, uh, some, some issues that were being looked at. You'd have to ask them, Lydia. Yeah. All right, last question, then we've got to go. Last question.
agendas before us, uh, not the least of which is to deliver cheaper, cleaner electricity, uh, support job creation here in this state and make sure that we get Queenslanders healthy and safe through the pandemic. There are a range of other demands upon government, but we've got to make sure that we prioritise those uh, that are most important for Queenslanders. Oh, I reject the assertion that anyone's intervened in anything. Well, they're not a matter for me. So. Thank you. Thank you.